so when you were um, throwing these parties and buying equipment and in your, your shed or your garage, um, did you have much of a sense of what was going on either in other parts of Berlin or perhaps in other parts of the world? Because when you're kind of describing the environment where you were growing up in, very industrial, it makes me think of like a city like Detroit, which was also very industrial and has like very clear links to the music that was being made. So this is kind of a two-part question. Do you think that your environment um, affected the music that you were making? And also, were you aware of what was going on in other places? Of course. Um, I think that environment was the perfect playground for that. Same in, uh, in, in other um, areas where you have a really important subculture, like Manchester, like... Um, Sheffield. Uh, Sheffield, London. Um, yeah. So you have creative hotspots. You had... In the 80s and early 90s, which were very important. I think it was also the space we had, the empty spaces. So we didn't have an idea about Manchester or Detroit back then. We know there was music from Detroit. That was stuff we uh, listened on the radio or when we bought records, but we didn't have an idea how it feels to be there. So for us, it was always a huge adventure to go to Tresor, to Berlin, which is just like 30 minutes away so and when you are little you are in your own bubble and you don't really um, see the world mm -hmm. how it is and um, I think we just used the empty spaces yeah after the reunification like all, a lot all these uh, uh, industrial spots were like abandoned and then we had all these empty spaces and the police and like everyone was confused about the new situation that like a whole society turns into a new society and they had like their own problems so we had like also a space to do whatever we wanted to do so we had the luck that techno music was the thing i think that techno and all the underground scene was part of the um also changed the society when we w grew up we were surrounded not only by nice people, so we had a lot of skinheads and Nazis and hooligans surrounding us. And like people like us, we had a problem to kind of like get rid of them or like or escape or do our own thing with, without them um, getting in trouble with them. And they came to the parties and f when we started the first parties, they came and they didn't start trouble. So they saw there are many people, there are girls, so the music is kind of like cool and um, yeah, and on some point um, some of these people started doing like ecstasy and stuff and it changed their um, subcultural genre, I would say, <laughs> and turned them into like ravers and, um, <laughs> and it was something you could observe from, the, from a distance over a period of time and it was very interesting to watch because Chari and I, we were like basically working on the parties. We, we, we never took drugs and stuff like this too much, let's say it <laughs> like this. But we, we had to focus because we were the guys with the key in the end. So we had to like talk to the police when they came, stuff like this. So we could watch all these people and then you had like guys like skinheads we, we were scared of. And then a year later, after 12 months, you saw them and they were like the most happiest dancer on the dance floor <laughs> wearing colorful clothes and this this happened all over um, East Germany and maybe also West Germany at this time that a lot of people you weren't expecting on these type of parties um, changed their mind and that was the time when techno became so big so that was like techno is like a bad bug you can't kill it so you <laughs> You put poison and you make, you change the environment, but it comes back again and again. But looks always a little bit different, but basically it's still a bug, it's still the same. So when the people these days celebrating like 48 hours at Berghain and they, they explain how ex amazed they are about the experience, but this <laughs> happens here since I'm little. So this is how we grew up, so it didn't, didn't change. And when like all the like, hooligan and Nazi people turned into ravers, 
they started doing their own parties and for us it was the point where we thought, oh shit, now it's not cool anymore. So we have to find, we have to look for something new. And this was the point when we started making music because we wanted to make something different and we started looking for the beats which are not on the speakers before and this, this never changes. So, and I think um, we did like parties ourselves from the late 90s till 2003, 2004. And at the first record we released was an EP, a Loving Memory EP on Beepage Control in 2001. And the first album, Hello Mom, came in 2005. And since then we are touring constantly. I like that, that the end of your first phase is like the skinhead rehabilitation <laughs> via rave and then you're like, okay, we can move on. It's so true. It really happened. You could see, watch it. It was like transforming <coughs> a lot of these people. And to explain a, a, just a little bit more, um, going back, for example, from the Tresor Club at night, back home to the outskirts by night train, S-Bahn, it was... Dangerous. So, so dangerous. On the last uh, uh, train stops, some people came in, started um, smashing windows and lamps. I think we all had to give our stussy leather jackets away once for free to some of them in the train. So we got robbed several times. That was a, that was a, also a lot of space for these people too, you know? And... Um, yeah. So you decided to start experimenting with making music, but you were already doing live performance at the parties that you were throwing, is that right? Like it wasn't necessarily just DJing with records, there was kind of like a very gear heavy setup that was going on. Live performance means uh, just playing with the machines with no plan. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the no concept uh, in the beginning and then um, but we found out to have a yeah to work with playlists and also to combine drum machines and records turntables and uh, to make uh, to to collage you know that was the beginning of our performance <laughs> when i when i met him so I'm a little younger than him, but when I met him, it was like this. So he had all these machines, and but they were just jamming and see what happens all the time. And I wanted to um, control more, mm -hmm. and but I didn't have the skills, the technical skills. So I didn't, I didn't know how the machines work. So we started making music and fo focus on on stuff, and we recorded it. That's only the good thing that someone presses the record button it's it's in a techno world um, often the problem from people who invest all their money into a modular system and they spend days weeks years in finding the perfect sound and <laughs> no one records it so. um, but what was that transition like going from these kind of like endless uh, jams into okay if we're going to put this out on a record, on B pitch, there has to be a start and there has to be an end. Like, I would imagine that that would require a different kind of mental process or creative process. It's, I think what we both early realized is that we um, always wanted to do this. We never wanted to do something else, so we decided to, to be this. So we, this is the first thing I think um, someone who wants to be an artist has, um, has to decide for themselves. I mean, that's a, that's a decision for life. So if you only try, you will always try. So I think you have to give everything all the time. So we always really wanted to do that. And I think it's for everything in life that you really need to know what you really want. It doesn't count if you only know what you don't want, because that will won't change anything. You have to know what you want. And you, and fear is just something in your mind. All of you are creative people, and I think creativity is is something that that you have a connection to create, and that you can like transform what you have inside or what you channel from somewhere to to turn it into something visible or listenable. If you don't hear this voice loud enough, or you don't follow this voice, it won't happen. It doesn't matter 
what instrument you play, what music you like, it doesn't matter. It's a decision for it. you have to make for yourself. And we both, we really, we, we, we are so much in love with this adventure of music since we met. He never met someone who was so much in love with music and I met never someone who was so much in music before. And of course now we know a lot of people and we can excite people about how amazing music can be and how, how amazing creation can be. And um, so it's basically that you never give up and that you follow um, your instincts. Mm -hmm.